gentlemen, I'm Steve Cheney. I'm the CEO of the American Security Project, and I'm pleased that you're here today. I think we've got a really great speaker going to talk to us about Defense Budget 2014. Uh, let me talk for a second about ground rules and the American Security Project and a little bit about the budget. Uh, first, we're going to run for an hour exactly, 12.30 to 1.30, so we'll be done. We are going to tweet it, and our hashtag is up here. And uh, we will also, we're also taping it, so it will be up on our website, the whole thing live, probably tomorrow uh, afternoon, and we also take some, some photos. Um, it's on the record, so you feel free to quote us. Uh, let me talk about American Security Project for a minute. We were founded in 2006 by Senators Kerry Hart Rudman and Hagel, and it was after, in the aftermath of the 2004 election. And both Senators Hagel and Kerry thought when they talked climate security, energy security, nuclear security, those topics that they weren't always discussed in a rational way and the facts couldn't get out and they were usually painted either far left wing or far right wing. So they put together this small nonprofit to hopefully get the facts out on each one of those issues. And we kept it small. This is a very small organization. We've got about a dozen permanent staff or so. We have an ancillary group called the Consensus. The board was put together so that we would have flag officers, three and four star from each of the services, in addition to an equal number of Republicans and Democrats, and a number of businessmen and women also on the board that would help support us. And, and we've thrived over the last decade or so on these specific issues, and sometimes we expand it, which gets us to today's topic, which is Defense Budget 2014. And you might ask, what uh, what is our interest in this? And uh, one of our thoughts here at the American Security Project is the budget's not always tailored to what our strategy is, and we think that it ought to be, and that's a big, big topic and a tough one. And then when you look at the defense budget in its entirety, it's very complicated. There's a lot of factors associated with it. Uh, I am not an expert in it. I certainly was a recipient when I spent 30 plus years as a Marine. Uh, but I think Russell will lend some daylight at least to this issue and talk about the defense budget this year and, and maybe touch on a little bit about the future. Uh, those who don't know Russell, he's got a remarkable background. He was an Army infantry officer. He was a senior associate at the Stimson Center, an expert on defense budgeting. He's had experience with the Senate Budget Committee, was a military legislative or uh, liaison assistant to Congressman Jim Cooper, later lead staffer for Congressman Cooper, dealing with roles and missions on the Armed Services Committee. He served in the Office of Secretary of Defense with the CIA, and of course he's had distinguished service with our Army. With that, Russell, let me turn it over to you. Uh, the floor is yours, and then uh, afterwards we'll do a queue. We'll perhaps a little conversation among the two of us, and then we'll open up to have a Q&A. Well, thanks, General Cheney. Thanks to everybody for being here. Thanks to the American Security Project for having me. Uh, I certainly appreciate uh, a place such as the American Security Project, which is trying to look at answers and tease out from all the technical detail, actual policy conclusions, and inform the debate. So hopefully I add a little bit here today. I obviously am biased, and I think you can learn a lot from looking at the budgets, <coughs> and that they do matter to how we figure out what US policy is, both internal in the US and uh, abroad. Uh, it's not totally a crazy thing to say. Frank Kendall, the current under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition Technology and Logistics testified this week, and in fact he said, hey, the, it's, it's not just our budget, that's also our plan. This is what we intend to do, and of course, hopefully that is what the budget is, but because it's pushed through its own process, there's a lot of skewing that happens to it, and it's not always obvious to line up what's going on in the budget with what that strategy is. So hopefully conversations like this, interest from folks like you, we can plumb those areas and figure out, is the budget doing what uh, people are saying it's doing? Is it doing what we think it should be doing? And how do we make it better? So hopefully this sets the groundwork for having exactly that conversation. We're at an interesting period to be having this conversation, I'll admit. Uh, in some ways, I think there's really good news in a lot of the uncertainty seems to be gone now passage of the Bipartisan Budget Act, the last deal that happened in December, we have what seem to be fairly stable caps, the total top line spending that's going to happen both for defense and non-defense. 
we've just been through a large uh, several years of uncertainty. A lot of laws were passed, a lot of deals were cut. And those didn't in any way mean the uncertainty was over. So maybe I'm being too optimistic, but this time seems a little different. It seems like it's, uh, it's something people can agree on and can adhere to. So in that sense, I think we kind of know where we're at and we can start asking those questions. On the flip side, it's always tough when you're looking at the budget and you have to talk a month before the president's budget comes out because frankly, that's where you find out, you only get really one cut once a year to find out, to, to put things down on paper looking forward to reading through all those spreadsheets. So you'll have to bear with me as I don't know, uh, but more importantly, nobody quite knows until that budget is released. But hopefully we can tee up a conversation so we can better judge what happens when we do see the plan come out. I think the first point we need to make is if the bipartisan budget act holds, if these caps that are in place hold, you're going to settle out at significantly higher defense spending than any of the past build downs. Okay, well, so now I already got to start capping. So build down. We've done it four times. Uh, in the 50s, the defense budget went down. In the 70s, the defense budget went down. In the 90s, the defense budget went down. And now it's going down again. Uh, how related are those downturns? It's tough to see. It's really obvious to take a step back and say, oh, the defense budget goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. It looks really cyclical, but why? Well, that's a much harder question. Is it because we went to war, like in Korea, or Vietnam, or the war on terror? Maybe, then why did it go up in the 80s when we had no hot war? Oh, because that was the Cold War. Well, of course, it's been the Cold War for a few decades already. So it's a little tough to tell why it's going up and down. So and we have to be a little careful drawing the conclusions, but nevertheless, in those downturns, and obviously the budget today is lower than it was a few years ago, and certainly lower than it was five years ago. So higher is a relative thing. But in the 50s, the lowest point the defense budget got to was 373 billion. In the 70s, 384 billion. In the 90s, 391 billion. None of them broke 400 billion, or they all went south of 400 billion dollars in today's terms, so making this constant dollars. On average, that's 380 about. If the Bipartisan Budget Act holds, we're going to look at a DOD budget of something like $480 billion as the low point. 480 versus 380. 25% higher than the downturns we went through during the 50s, 70s, and 90s. Two of those during the Cold War. Two of those when we were still facing an existential threat threat with the uh, Soviets. That seems pretty dramatic. It seems pretty dramatic that while drawing the defense budget down, we're actually going to land at a spot a quarter higher than where you, where you used to land. And by the way, I'm not counting war costs. Uh, you probably already know that, that during the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, we started budgeting running two defense budgets. There was the everyday defense budget, and then there was the budget for the cost of the war how strict and hard those lines are, probably not that strict, but nevertheless, there are these two budgets, and they clearly respond to slightly different uh, incentives and prompts. So it's important to keep them up. When I say $480 billion, I'm talking about just the base budget, not the war budgets. For this year, for FY14, Congress just appropriated $85 billion more. President's just told us he's going to get all the, uh, most of the troops out of Afghanistan, uh, so maybe that war budget's going to go away. At the same time, we've had a war budget since 1991 when we went to war with uh, Iraq for the first time in the Gulf War. We have had some kind of war budget. In the 90s, it was only two or three million dollars a year to maintain uh, the no-fly zones in Iraq and the Balkan peacekeeping episodes. Uh, it spikes when you go in Kosovo to about $9 billion. And in fact, the first Bush administration, I'm sorry, the second Bush administration tried to get away from that, tried to end it, and in fact submitted no war funding, no supplemental funding, overseas contingency operation funding for 2001 in July. And then 9-11 happened, and Congress <coughs> provided $40 billion. They literally appropriated it just to the executive office of the president. This is an emergency. Here's some money, Mr. President figure out what needs to be done. Uh, 
and that did flow into war funding, of course, ever since then we've been having war funding. So if you added those on top, now you're talking about 50% above the downturns we hit during the Cold War. I can't tell you what war funding is going to be, but even if it's just a base budget, even if just the bipartisan budget that holds, we're going to have a defense budget 25% higher than its previous lows. I'm a little suspicious we've seen a fundamental structural change. We certainly saw that during the Cold War. Coming out of World War II, World War II is just crazy enough. Off the chart, literally very hard to make a chart about the defense budget and put World War II on. But getting out of World War II, everybody assumes we're going to do what the US has always done, which is get out of the war-making business basically totally. Uh, take it down to a very small handful, you know, John Wayne at Indian Post out in the middle of nowhere. And they were doing a pretty good job demobilizing. Along comes the Korean War, and all of a sudden, we resettle at a very significantly higher level. And so you look at the defense budget going up and down, but the national security state uh, during the Cold War is fundamentally different than the rest of US history. Are we at a new structural change? Have the geopolitics changed? Is this the post-Cold War world? Is it the war on terrorism <coughs> world? We faced terrorism in the 80s and 70s as well. Is there a structural change, and is there a ge geopolitical reason? Is there a strategic reason underlying it? Or are, do we need to start sniffing around for other, uh, for more suspicious skewing reasons why it's settled higher? But nevertheless, first point I think we should take away from where we're at in 2014 on the defense budget is even though we're in a declining defense budget, it's actually much higher than it's been in previous declining defense budgets. Uh, then I'd like to peel back and look a little bit at what's in the defense budget. And although we can certainly get to, to more fine-grained judgments in the conversation in the Q&A, I think your first takeaway has to be, this is kind of a healthy defense budget. Healthy, OK, but what does healthy mean? Well, primarily what healthy means is I'm trying to assess what's the readiness of the current force. And I'm going to use a really rough measure, which is how much money are we spending on readiness? kind of take the defense budget and break it up into some big pots, right? People costs, personnel costs, uh, especially military personnel, which are easier to separate out. Modernization, the research, development, and procurement of stuff. And then the readiness funding. Uh, it's usually called operations and maintenance. It pays for training, it pays for buying minor stuff like your toilet paper, it pays for buying your gas, uh, it pays for the cost of your spilling. Why it's a little bit harder is to say a people cost versus a readiness cost, pays for travel, that kinds of things. In the omnibus, it just passed appropriations, the final appropriations for FY14, the, the, that omnibus had to, the last marks on the wall we had were the book, the Senate and House marks coming off the present budget. All three of those all ignored that sequester happened. They were $50 billion higher than what sequester was going to require. $50 billion. 10%. That means we're not getting a good sense of what the defense budget looks like. Looks like when you've got a 10% swing about to happen. Uh, with the Bipartisan Budget Act, they bought back $20 billion. That still means there was a $30 billion drop from what the President requested, what the House appropriated, what the Senate appropriated, and what they needed to come up with. How do you come up with $30 billion? Well, the way they did it was by cutting O&M, by cutting that readiness funding I just talked about. $15 billion, half of the $30 billion cut came from readiness. Another $11 billion came from modernization, procurement and rd t and &E. Well, if it made up the big cut, why am I saying it looks healthy? Because there's this thing called war costs. Not only have there been two separate budgets, they're treated differently. The war costs don't count against those spending caps that are uh, constraining the rest of the discretionary budget. So war costs are kind of free money. It doesn't count against your counts your caps, and you get the war budget. Congress added $9 billion in readiness funding into the war budget. When I say added, I mean they provided the president the readiness funding he asked for, and then they added another $9 billion. So cut $15 billion in the base, plus up $9 billion. That's still an overall cut, but it's not much of a cut, uh, especially when we look back at FY13, which had already been taken by sequester. And I'd like to go a step further and say that it builds on the FY13 president's request. Okay, now I've got a lot of not a lot of years going on. So we're, we're about to head into 15. 
We just finalized 14, and now I want to tell you about the budget before that, the 13 budget, uh, which to some extent is almost irrelevant because after the president requested it, we then went through two years of uncertainty about how sequester was going to be handled. But in that 13 budget, which was the one that was supposed to meet the original caps, the caps that came out in the first deal, the Budget Control Act, like how they did that to us, BCA, BBA, great. BCA is first, BBA is second. They can't even get it alphabetical for us. Uh, the BCA is the first one to say, okay, we're not going to let discretionary spending keep going. This is the cap. This is, you can't spend more than this. So the President's budget, the FY13 budget, was the first defense budget that went down in nominal terms. The first time since 1997. So that's a long time we've been having an increase in defense budget. First time somebody has proposed a cut to the defense budget. It's just a proposal. Because of the uncertainty, Congress didn't actually listen to the proposal for the most part. Uh, and in fact, all they did was keep it flat, so there was no cut. But the most important thing is despite cutting the top line in the President's request, that O&M funding was dramatically increased. $12 billion increase. Whole defense budget comes down $4 billion, yet O&M gets increased $12 billion. That is a pretty serious effort. That takes a lot of work to not just carve out $4 billion, but carve out $16 billion out of other priorities. They prioritize the readiness. They prioritize the tank miles. They prioritize the flying hours. Those things that don't buy the planes, but keep the planes flying. They keep the pilots trained on uh, flying. That's what the president submitted. And now Congress has doubled down on that with the omnibus, where we've seen yet another reprioritization to readiness funding. You can always have a, one of the problems with figuring out whether the, the budget correctly reflects strategy is we probably have a debate about what our strategy should be. So there's always a little bit of uncertainty. But probably we can all agree whatever we decide, we want it to be ready. We want it in good shape now. Wildly, despite the defense budget coming down, <coughs> the budget is paying for those things that keep the force ready, that keep it healthy today. Uh, that is a pretty impressive feat, especially as, they, as uh, all of the actors face this need to bring spending down. Um, we can go through some of the other ones really quick of the modernization. Uh, again, it divides up into procurement and research and development. Research and development looks fairly healthy. It's a slight cut, but research and development in the 90s did not actually have to pay much to keep that seed corn for the future. And then procurement absolutely was cut, like I said. Uh, coughed up $11 billion of modernization funding, most of that procurement um, absolutely got cut. Truthfully, that's what always happens. Procurement always gets cut first and most. That's the easiest to get at. It turns out you're not actually spending that money. You're authorizing that money, and it will be spent out in the coming years. So when you take it back, no one notices right away. And the other secret is when the defense budget starts going up, procurement goes up first and fastest as well. So it, it cycles just like the defense budget, except with higher peaks and lower, uh, lower drops. Military personnel is a, a hotly important issue. Uh, you know, there's no question that it is the American service member who serves uh, as the basis of all that the American military achieves. Right? Our fancy planes are only possible because we have really smart and well-trained Americans flying. Uh, our digitized and network tanks and fighting vehicles only work because we have young men and women who are capable of running those things. Personnel have to be uh, the, the ground. At the same time, each individual person is getting more and more expensive. That puts attention. How many people, how low in, can you go in people and still buy the stuff and the training to keep those people armed and ready? Uh, that's attention we're, we're wrestling through right now. The one insight I would provide, though, is military personnel as an aggregate hasn't actually changed much. We're spending about 27% on military personnel. Military personnel. Uh, that's their pay, it's most of their benefits, including retirement, but it's not uh, all of their health care. A lot of their health care is at OM. Uh, the numbers I quoted you about increased at OM don't include health care increases, and health care increases are absolutely happening. Uh, so we're just talking about the, the pay and non health care benefits for the most part about military personnel. In today's budget, about 27% of the defense budget. 2003, just as we're really launching the war efforts, about 26% of the defense budget. 
1998, we've just started increasing the defense budget again uh, for the first time since 1986, about 27%. 1990, right before we take the steep peace dividend drawdown, about 27%. 1980, just a few years into the all-volunteer force and before we hit the big Reagan buildup, about 30%. 1970, height of the, or the end of the Vietnam War, 35%. Those numbers mean the military personnel are not actually eating the defense budget. They're not actually increasing the costs. Because we have a lot less people. Each individual person is more expensive, but whereas we used to keep about 3 million people in uniform in the 80s, now we are headed to just above 1.2 million, or just south of 1.3. So by taking out those number of people, how many people you have is the biggest determinant of how much you're spending on military personnel. So even though they're more expensive, because we have so much less of them, we're not spending that much. It's not eating the readiness budget. It's not eating the modernization budget. Uh, an important thing to, uh, to, uh, to keep in mind, doesn't mean we don't need to res wrestle between that tension of people. It's again, how many people do we need? How many people do we need to fly the planes, uh, drive the tanks? And then uh, if I can end with one last observation, uh, one of the other things these spending caps do is put all of the defense dollars in competition with each other. And outside of the Department of Defense is, is our nuclear weapons spending, which is for the most part over at the Department of Energy to build by the actual bombs. And those two are now competing with each other, even though they're sort of complementary uh, capabilities. The FY14 omnibus is about two billion more than the post-sequester FY13. Because of the deal, there's just a little bit of relief, $2 billion, that's not a big deal, a $550 billion defense budget, but there's a little bit of relief. One billion of that went to the NNSA, run the nuclear weapons for us. One, million, one billion of that went to the NNSA's weapons activities. Weapons activities is what how we actually steward, stockpile, maintain uh, the, the nuclear warheads. Why that's a big deal is one, it's 50% of the slight increase they got. Okay, this is how much money out of 13, we're gonna give you just a very slight relief. Half of it's going to this one account. This one account, which is only $7 billion to start. So that $1 million is a big swing. Uh, and in fact, has been made whole. So the plans that sort of uh, uh, were established under the new start debate of how we're gonna modernize the nuclear infrastructure, which is a very robust plan, have been fully funded on the bus, even though that now means we're taking away dollars from those tanks, airplanes, and everything else we buy in defense. Uh, that is a really interesting tension. In 2014, is this really where we need to be spending our money? If I can uh, steal a moment and plug some of the work we've done, we just held an event where we had the former chief of staff of the Air Force, uh, Norty uh, Schwartz, come in, and he doesn't think that was the right balance specifically worried about uh, a large part of that modernization plan is refurbishing the B-61, which is our dropped uh, nuclear weapon, uh, our gravity dropped nuclear weapon. Some of that goes, one of, a version of that goes on our strategic bombers, B-2, but other versions go on the fighters we keep in Europe and our European allies keep to drop the tactical nuclear weapons nuclear weapons that nobody ever plans on using, yet it's going to drive a large, that, that requirement is going to drive a large part of the new demand. And oh, by the way, we have the largest acquisition system project ever, the F-35, which also has to be made nuclear capable. Take a, a program that has a lot going on and put another demand on it. And General Schwartz said, General Schwartz's point is, this is crazy that in a capped environment, these other alternatives were going forward. He's not arguing about getting rid of nuclear weapons. He thinks we should redirect the money towards the strategic bomber. But nevertheless, that's the question we now need to start having. It's within this capped defense budget, where are we putting any marginal dollar? Is it to conventional capabilities? Is it to nuclear capabilities? Is it to personnel? Is it to readiness? Is it to modernization? Those are the questions we're faced. And even when we answer the strategy question, we've got to start working that out. There's a chance this whole deal unwinds and we're back to uncertainty, but maybe we're standing at a point where we kind of see in the future. 
there's no doubt our defense budget and our defense forces are going to get smaller. It's a little bit interesting, I think, that they're going to be a large small. And I take heart, and it looks like they're shaping up to be a healthy small. So hopefully that answers a few of the questions about how we connect strategy to budget, and I'll look forward to the conversation. Well, that's a great comments. And questions from you? I want to just piggyback on, on your last one that uh, talked about the nuclear weapons issue, which has been a big issue at ASP since our inception. We were big proponents of New START. And when you look at we have what are going to 1,550 deployed nuclear weapons, and, and these days the hot, one of the big controversies, of course, what's going on at Malmstrom and all that is the readiness and the cheating on the exams. One of our, our thoughts was this is an opportunity here to reduce this force and save a significant amount of money and perhaps put it into other places or reduce the defense budget in its entirety. Uh, I'd just be interested in your thoughts about that in particular. And I understand General Schwartz's comment. He, he a bomber pilot, he wants to put in the bombers or someone and put them in the subs. I, 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 we still feel we've got too many of all, all three legs on there. Of course, the D-61, having handled nuclear weapons myself, um, I just think I, I have a hard time envisioning ever wanting to use a D-61 in any circumstance. So any, any thoughts about that in particular? Well, I should tell you, we should all be scared that we're thinking about that we once thought about letting Marines handle nuclear weapons. That clearly was a bad idea. Uh, or more seriously, it does seem like a great point where, I, where you know, there isn't a conversation about how we use those tactical nuclear weapons. They're just not there, largely because our conventional capability is so awesome. Um, there was a, a famous article about the nuclear weapons budget written in 2000 called The Hunt for Small Potatoes. Uh, obviously, there are very good reasons and important reasons to debate nuclear weapons and what their role for the U.S. should be. We've got a president who's argued we should move to get rid of them. Uh, it's always nice if you can back that up with some, oh, great cost savings. And for a long time, that frankly wasn't true. Uh, in the mid-90s, in the peace dividend, we dramatically dropped our uh, nuclear arsenal, and we dramatically cut, the, uh, cut how much money we spent on nuclear weapons. Uh, and cut it and it stayed stable even as the, the total defense budget increased dramatically in the last 15 years uh, or 17 years the the nuclear part didn't increase and so for a long time uh, folks who wanted to argue that we should get rid of nuclear weapons for uh, their own reasons had a hard time hijacking the budget conversation well that's now fundamentally changed because of modernization programs the modernization of the the, the Arsenal, the stockpile, the warheads themselves. We're going to buy a new bomber, and we're going to buy a new nuclear submarine. All of a sudden, a quarter of what we spend on nuclear weapons is going to be for new stuff. So the moment is coming where we have to make these decisions, and those, uh, and that is rippling throughout the budget. You can uh, find the Navy start stressing over their anxiety of how they're going to buy six billion dollar a pop nuclear new ballistic missile submarines when they still want to buy marine and sort of want to buy marine amphibious ships, really want to buy uh, surface commands and really want to buy aircraft carriers. Uh, the Air Force is facing this problem too. They, think, they still think they need to uh, enlarge and modernize their fighter forces, yet they have to, they're talking about at least a $55 billion program for their bomber. How do we, are we really going to make these decisions to move forward on all these legs even as we're still debating about what the nuclear strategy of the United States should be. So we're at an incredibly important moment for making these choices right now. Well, you bet. And I think we can bring some light to that here at ASP and sort of the Stimson Center. And just a second comment about military personnel, and I, I was a, perhaps a big beneficiary of the Reagan years. I, I very distinctly remember coming in in, in 1971, and we, we had a draft Marine Corps and a draft Army. Um, and I can tell you statistically the quality uh, was not there. And then uh, in the Reagan years, I also very vividly remember getting all new artillery, I was an artillery officer, all new weapons, and when I raids, all the new Humvees, and pay increased dramatically for our troops. And the quality came up in, in contrast with that. And so as we followed through that, uh, when I ran recruiting for uh, half the Marine Corps in the late 90s, uh, you, you may remember the economy was singing along pretty good. 99, 2000, and we were having a tough time recruiting. The pay was 
pay was still pretty good, though. We were getting good kids. Then, of course, we had 2001 or 911. Uh, pay has still gone up, and I tell you, the quality of the uh, Airman, Soldier, Sailor, Marine today is phenomenal. And I also think they're being compensated pretty well for it, frankly. So when I when I look at that, and I hear, hear your comment about 27 percent, but we're spending 27 percent now on a smaller force, and that force is going to get mm, maybe dramatically smaller than that, but will we still retain the 27% pay scale to attract the young kid that, that's coming in today, the quality young man or woman? And so I'd be interested in your comments about that aspect of it. Right. U.S. military has a problem. Its biggest problem, it's made up of Americans. Americans are expensive, right? If you're looking to worry about labor costs, the first thing you do is not go to America. Right, let's go somewhere else. Let's go to China. Let's go to Mexico. It's a little hard to do that when they're the U, we're the U.S. military. We're not contracting out our armed forces to China. Frankly, we're even trying to cheat around the edges. Right? They, they, one of the great outcomes of uh, the, the last 10 years was this acknowledgement that we had people who did not yet have citizenship, but were serving the United States, and they created fast-track citizenship. Uh, I personally think that's a great and noble thing. Uh, you can look at it in a much more jaundiced eye and say, man, how can we pay, how can we get uh, non-Americans into the force? Well, let's get them just before they become Americans. Uh, that's going to be a real problem. Number two, the all-volunteer force is expensive. Frankly, I don't think we're seeing the end of it. It's all-volunteer force, 1974, big pay raises in the uh, uh, Reagan buildup, big pay raises in the 90s under Clinton. I got a benefit, got to watch my salary bump up nicely without doing anything extra, it's nice. Uh, but frankly, it's only in the last 10 years that we've built decent barracks. Uh, buddies of mine who got called back to go to Iraq early in the war were brought back despite being uh, post-undergraduate, already served as officers in the uh, US Army, and then they were put in bay barracks, right? Just like the, the movies, you sit in a bunk bed you can smell the guy next to you three feet away. You're going to pay this guy how much to be in here, and then you're going to make him sleep in a sleeping arrangement he hasn't done since, a ten, since he was 10 years old at a sleepover? Like that, that's a little crazy. Now, thankfully, we've started making big strides on that, and the barracks are pretty nice now. And for the most part, you get one roommate. That's still something most, uh, college, most college students don't put up with after their freshman year. Uh, frankly, I think there's a lot of places we're still going to see the cost of individual uh, soldiers and sailors increase because we need to correctly acknowledge that this is part of a workforce and we need them not to uh, not just serve the United States because uh, of their patriotism and belief, but because this is a good opportunity for them. So I think we have more costs to come. Um, there's also the third problem, or the third point of just increased benefits. One of the things that happened in the increasing defense budget, you'll notice the defense budget went up a lot, yet the military personnel cost stayed the same. Some of that is from growing benefits. TRICARE for life. Right? When you become Medicare eligible, you have no medical costs if you've retired from the US military. Uh, the increased pay raises, the pay raises above the increased uh, cost of uh, employment cost for the rest of America. There are real choices here, and maybe worse and most importantly, our personnel system is still based on this very strange 19th century military system that was then heavily flavored by a 50s, 1950s paternalistic take. So uh, the number one way to increase your salary if you're a junior Marine, get married. They'll give you a new house, get you out of the barracks, give you a new house, and give you some extra money just because you went and got married. Is that a little bit odds? Is a, is a married soul, is a married marine really helping us on the battlefield? Should we be incentivizing? Obviously, uh, if we have a young marine who falls in love, we should support that family and support those dependents. But should we be encouraging them? Go, just find somebody who's willing to put up with you, and we'll give you more money, right? Maybe, maybe we should wait, and maybe we should wait till they find their soulmate, and then figure out how to make sure they can live a, a happy life as a couple. So there's real problems out there. There's real opportunity. There's real ways to go in and change how we spend money on personnel while taking better care of our soldiers, sailors, and airmen 
and updating and modernizing the system. Great comments, and I agree with them all. Let me open it up to Q&A. We've got a roving microphone. If you could put your hand in your ear, and I'll, I'll identify you. If you could identify yourself and ask, hopefully, a short question. I can get as many as we get this young lady right here. That's working. Hi. Um, Sandra Erwin with National Defense Magazine. Uh, Russell, I wanted to ask you about the, the um, report that we saw today come out from the uh, Commission on the Structure of the Air Force. Um, they made an economic argument that the activity of the Air Force is too expensive, kind of what you guys were just talking about just now. Um, and uh, they have to shift more missions to the Guard and Reserve because they are less expensive. Um, do you buy that argument? I mean, is, are they making do you think they made a compelling enough case for that? Just curious about your thoughts. Uh, I think it was a very bold report that just came out today. Uh, I'm not sure they said the active Air Force is too expensive. They did explicitly say the reserve and guard components are cheaper. Uh, and in fact, this, was a hot, this has been a hotly debate, uh, debated issue for about a year. And they frankly admit there's a lot of assumptions you have to make. You cannot get a just straight numerical comparison, and instead they give a bullet point list of here's why we think uh, the reserve component is less expensive, and then explicitly says, and in this, in, in this constrained budget environment, the Air Force needs to do that. Um, it's a particularly important statement from this commission, because this commission arose when the Air Force submitted its FY13 budget and had dramatically cut the Guard and Reserve while preserving their active force structure. Uh, despite the active uh, force, force structure only making up, up about 17% of units, it was approaching 70% of the cuts the Air Force proposed. Uh, you can come up with a story about how the Air Force, run by active duty Air Force officers, tend to think the right answer is more active duty Air Force officers and planes. Uh, is that the story? Who knows? They had a whole analysis about why. But by the commission saying, no, we've looked at it, and we really do think the Guard and Reserve are a better deal, and you do need to consider this. That is a really strong pronouncement. And they offered some really specific ways, uh, more associated units, mixed units, mixing reserve, guard, and active together, putting the reserves more in, reserve and guard guys more into uh, uh, missions that right now are, are basically totally active duty. So it's a really powerful argument. And frankly, I think one we might have already seen the answer. We've seen that why this is, continues to be important is well, what's the Air Force's proposal this year going to be? And what does the Air Force's uh, approaches mean for the other services, particularly the Army, which also has a heavy reserve component? Although, frankly, my take is Congress isn't averse to cutting the Guard and Reserve. Yes. The reserve component, especially in a guard, National Guard, is a priority of Congress. They have a particular allegiance to it. If for more than 100 years, they've backed this idea. Uh, it's really not that hard to understand. We have a federal system with both the Congress and President, neither of whom are in charge of each other. The President owns most of the military. The Congress kind of likes the idea that there's a bit of a military that reports to them, not to the President. They don't literally, but because it's regionally based, they're much more open. But I don't think that allegiance and prioritization is absolute. We're, the defense budget's going down. We're going to cut. We're going to cut everything. That doesn't mean the Guard and Reserve can't be cut. Frankly, the numbers we've heard come out about where the Army might go, I think they had a good balance. They do cut the Guard. They do cut the Reserves. But they also cut the active and strength. Uh, in fact, the Guard and Reserve are about 10 or 11 percent. And these are not yet formal numbers. But Guard and Reserve are cut about 10 percent whereas the actives cut about 17%. Maybe that's the right mix. I think it's certainly a mix that Congress is willing to hear the argument about and not just dismiss and set up a commission to go back and say, seriously, were these guys crazy or not? And I, and a quick follow-up. Is, is cutting fleets of airplanes a smart thing to save money, to be more efficient? I mean, not just the Air Force, but the Army now is trying to do the same thing. Uh, so the Air Force has been arguing that they need to do vertical cuts. Right? They have this force structure, which is made up of bombers, fighters like the F-22, F-15, F-16, and then A-10s, this primarily close air support. 
And they say instead of taking having less A10s, F15s, F16s, uh, F22s, and B2s, what we should do is just get rid of A10s so we don't have to get rid of as many more. Uh, it, it's a fraught argument because partly because it's cross cutting across responsibilities. The A10 doesn't support the Air Force very much, right? It doesn't really do an Air Force mission, it's supporting a ground mission. Frankly, the Army has basically said, ah, we don't need it, we believe the Air Force, they'll be in the Air Force. Uh, the Marines have never bought into that argument and can't talk you back to Tarawa and say, we can't trust anybody to have our airplanes with us except us. Apparently the Army thinks they can rely on the Air Force to be there. Uh, I'm, I'm a tad disappointed in it because I think it's a very narrow vision, especially from the Army's point of view. In the last decade, there was this hotly contested fight about whether the Air Force should buy these things called C-27s, small cargo planes. And the Army said, we got to have them. The Air Force was like, no, you don't. The Army said, we got to have them so bad, we're going to buy them ourselves. And the Air Force said, no, 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 you can't buy them. In fact, you can't buy them because we agreed to this in 1948 at the Key West Agreement. Uh, Fast forward six years, sure enough, the, Air, the Army wasn't allowed to buy them. And sure enough, as soon as times got tight, the Air was like, oh yeah, we're not buying these things either. And they're gone. We literally bought a couple dozen of them, never flew them, and are immediately handing them off to, some will stay in SOCOM, some will go to the Coast Guard, and some they still haven't figured out what to do with. That seems a little crazy to me. And I think you can trace it back to this 1948 decision. I think the Army might be a little short-sighted and not saying, wait a minute. The Air Force is going to give us fixed wing aircraft? Yes, it's a new expense, even at a time we're trying to cart a budget, but we think fixed wing aircraft are an important part of the combined arms. Maybe we should make that organic to ourselves, be a little bit more like the Marine Corps, and maybe the next time the defense budget goes up, they'll find out, hey, I don't need to buy these expensive helicopters because I've got these fixed wing aircraft and don't need to negotiate with the Air Force. So I'm a little sad we're not pulling this opportunity to rewrite what the relations between the services are. Uh, the tactical question of whether you need an A-10 or whether precision-guided munitions uh, help, I would leave that to the people who actually had one of those bombs saved their lives. I remember well the uh, roles and missions debate in 94 yeah, 95 when they discussed close air support. And uh, at one juncture, there was a proposal to uh, take all the close air support out of the Air Force, give it to the Marines, let them support the Army. And the Marines said, no, we, we're happy with our own, thank you. So it's always been a hot topic. And you would think QDR, which is coming up here pretty quick, I think next month, uh, might address some of this, but uh, I have my doubts. And you would think you could also look back at the National Security Act, maybe do some revisions there, but I have my doubts on those as well. Uh, next question. Yes, sir, all the way in the back. Hi, Ken Meyer, Gert, World Dogs. What does the budget suggest about our overseas deployments, other than those that are directly related to the war effort? Uh, deployments actually, force of station overseas, or deployments where we were here and head out? Uh, the defense budget is big. $600 billion is nothing to sneeze at. Uh, there was an argument we, everybody has lost their argument. The start of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, those who were uh, wary of defense spending, actually supported the idea of a war budget because they thought, that's great. We'll keep the base budget from increasing and we'll just put the war costs in here. Well, turns out the war budget got really big and the base budget got really big. So their little inoculation plan didn't work. Um, at the same time, those people who liked the idea of two budgets because they just wanted more have run a little, uh, not quite, but what they wanted as both budgets got pulled back and maybe we're going to, although, as I said, we're going to end up at a much higher level, so maybe their bet did pay off. The most important this is how fungible the money is between base and war. When we did Haiti just a few years ago, the Defense Department, despite getting $160 billion for Iraq and Afghanistan, and despite getting $500 billion for base, said, oh, that island that you can see from Florida, that's a lie, but it's close. Uh, that island that you can see from Florida, for us to do anything there, you got to give us more money. Four billion dollars more, despite only being there for six to eight weeks. The very next year, after the passage of the bipartisan, uh, 
or I'm sorry, the, the Budget Control Act, after we started capping, we did not provide any supplemental funding for the earthquake relief in Japan, for the entire operation in Libya. Uh, we have not asked for uh, any of the money for the Philippine earthquake, so we've created this, uh, we've created these two budgets, but they don't seem to move totally in relation to outside forces, which makes me think we've got some things that are uh, throwing those off in the arguments of defense spending here at home. I, I wasn't really thinking of our one-off uh, deployments so much as our, our uh, troops in Japan and G Germany and the 700-odd bases we've got around the world. It would fit into more of the strategic. Uh, uh, absolutely. We've got 700 bases around the world. Uh, do you think we should be out in the world? Do you think we should be out in the world? But really, we can live in Kansas and drive out and fly out there occasionally. Or do you think we should not be out in the world? All valid questions. Frankly, not terribly much of a budget question. Uh, partly because our forces that are stationed abroad especially in Japan and, and Germany, the host nation helps defray some of those costs. To really get uh, budget savings, you need to get rid of those troops altogether, not just bring them back and put them in Kentucky or North Carolina. Uh, but absolutely, the number one thing we spend money on is this global military. It's not any given tank or any given airplane or any given person. It's the ability to take them and send them anywhere in the world at a moment's notice. Sam Brown, I'm an adjunct here. Hey Sam, how are you? Uh, the uh, fact that uh, one quarter of the nuclear budget is for new stuff, as you indicated, what's the strategic rationale for that, given, at least on the surface, the appearance of it contradicting the President's uh, desire to reduce the role of nuclear weapons? Is it new targets? new role, uh, more extended deterrence, what's the strategic rationale? So the strategic rationale is simply that the triad, subs, bombers, land-based ICBMs, are necessary to maintain US nuclear security. It's the same strategic argument we've had for at least 20 years, maybe even back into the 80s. Uh, although we're going to buy a bunch of new stuff, it's, it's theoretically just to replace the old stuff. Um, for the submarines, that's close to literal. In fact, they're going to buy a couple less submarines than we currently have. On the bomber, they hoped to buy 100. They managed to buy 20 last time they bought a bomber, so we'll see how close, how close they get to that. But the strategic rationale is this triad. Now, this is horrible. Not only am I going to shill for myself, I'm not even going to shill for you. I'm going to shill for somebody other than you guys. Uh, the Cato Institute just did a recent study which I found fascinating, that look back, why did we ever decide to try it matters? If you don't know, the, the talking points you're supposed to say is, well, ICBMs provide stability, submarines provide survivability, and bombers provide flexibility. That's the shorthand. Uh, there's a reasonable debate that maybe you don't need all three of them to provide each of those idiots. Uh, and the Cato Institute has a study that goes back and looks at, well, why did we buy three legs of the triad? And their basic argument is, yeah, I had nothing to do with the outside world. This was purely bureaucratic politics within the Pentagon. The Navy wanted this, the Air Force wanted that. And in fact, the Army made a move to get into it and got rebuffed. In fact, I think are pretty happy now that yeah, they're not nice. staring at massive nuclear modernization. Now, Sam, you know, it's, uh, what they'll tell you in the military side is they're wearing out. So, and it could be a safety issue. So you need a, you need a newer submarine to be safe and be secure. And, Protected. The same thing goes on the missile side, the same thing goes on the bomber side. So it's a, that's been the argument. And of course, there was kind of a, an agreement made with the new start that they would fund replenishment, fund modernization in exchange for the vote to reduce our total nuclear arsenal. So uh, at least that's how the argument goes. Another question? Yes, sir, right here. Russell Austin Wright to Politico. Um, your briefing says that the FY14 omnibus offers tantalizing hints about the FY15 budget. Can you outline a few of those for us? Uh, absolutely. So, I said that specifically in the modernization part. 
are we going to buy all the things we've said we're going to buy in the last few years? Uh, unfortunately, it's these things, it turns out, I'm a think tanker, so my job is not to get scoops, unfortunately. Something Austin Port does, although he's probably in trouble, depending on me. Uh, the uh, omnibus dramatically cut funding for the Army's ground combat vehicle. Their number one acquisition broker. They say, we got to have this. we got to replace our vehicle, our, our current armored vehicles. Uh, yet, out, out of a $600 million request, Congress cut that down to $100 million. Well, since Congress did that, the Chief of Staff has come out, the Chief of Staff of the Army has come out and said, yep, I don't think there's going to be a ground combat vehicle in the FY15 budget. So that's a pretty good hint. Um, the, other one, the other one I specifically mentioned in the brief is uh, the omnibus cuts advanced procurement for one Navy F-35 and two Air Force F-35s. Advanced procurement is not money we're going to spend this year, but money we're going to spend this year to buy one later. That suggests that we're going to see a delay in the F-35 program. I don't know that, but I, I suggest. Most importantly for this audience, I would stress the importance of how, although there's these many different actors and many different steps, it turns out the conversation is a little bit related. And maybe it's not just the uh, congressional appropriations staff just walking in there wildly whacking things, but maybe they've gotten at least some inclination from the building of where we're going to go. Because, because of this $30 billion drop, the FY15 budget is going to be a big deal. It's going to tell us more about the future of the budget than we've had for a number of years. Great. Another question. All the way in the back. Matthew Wallen, I'm a uh, fellow here at ASP and also controlling my own center. Um I have a question about the actual cost of things like munitions. When we're talking about actually engaging troops on the ground or, or enemy combatants on the ground, you know, the cost of a bullet versus something we drop from an aircraft, et cetera, et cetera, there's large discrepancies. So when we're talking about something like you know, a tow missile or, or a Hellfire missile, we're talking about literally throwing a Mercedes at the enemy in terms of cost. How can we address that better in the future to bring down the cost of some of this advanced weaponry? Uh, it's not clear we should totally be addressing that. I'd rather spend a million dollars than lose an American. Uh, and the United States has had that luxury at every point in its history except for when we started killing ourselves in the Civil War. Uh, it's an incredible luxury. It's a good idea to be a rich country. I'm pretty excited most days to know that I live in a rich country. Uh, and one of the, and although those munitions are expensive, uh, that's not actually the expensive part. Right? The expensive part is actually getting somebody there to fire it. And the cost of putting that guy who's going to fire that bullet, which, by the way, is still a couple bucks, Getting him all the way up there is expensive by itself and really scary strategically. At the same time, I better take advantage of this question, there are nasty pathologies in the defense budget. There's this constant striving for the best that there ever was. Uh, we are the richest country in the world. We have the largest, uh, the largest military by factors that's been true for decades now. We have a huge advantage. Maybe we don't still need to be trying to get the best of the best of the best and could be a little bit more comfortable with good enough. Um, wildly, sometimes we stumble into them. My favorite example is, is one of the coolest super new weapons we fire is the joint direct, direct attack munition, uh, which is what makes the bombs uh, precision guided. $25,000 a pop. Uh, sorry, $25,000 a pop when we first started buying them. I'm sure it's a little more expensive now, but relatively cheap. You get to blow up million dollar pieces of equipment with those bombs. You're getting a nice exchange rather than uh, the joke Matt made of we do occasionally use million dollar uh, weapons to blow up tens of thousand dollar targets. That sometimes doesn't feel like the best trade. Um, how did we get this jade? Ironically, one of the reasons we got the JDAM was because following the Gulf War, the Air Force saw the precision munitions needed to take off, but what they really, really cared about was stealth. They thought the future, the way that they were going to drop bombs was to have a really stealthy airplane that could go anywhere it wanted. So their priority was stealth. 
And stealth, 25 years later, is really, really expensive. They had to buy a precision munition, knew it was important, wasn't a high priority. And so the task, there's a, a great quote from uh, General McPeak, the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, who turns to his contractor, Northrop Grumman, and says, I'm only buying this thing if it's 25K. Uh, and he gets it. He gets this incredible science fiction piece of equipment, super cheap, and because, partly because he didn't care as much about it. The things he did care about, stealth, he only got 100, at the end of the day, the Air Force only got 187 F-22s because they were so expensive. That tension is very real and something we always need to guard against. And it's very painful that things, uh, especially the military services care most about, end up being the things that cost the most because they care about them. That's not the best system, that's right. But sometimes it works. Russell, your comments have been fabulous. I really appreciate everybody coming today. Uh, please hit our website. We've got, a, we got, I think, eight or nine major events coming up in February, spanning a number of great topics that I'm sure you'll be interested in. Russell, we really appreciate you being here. Let's give him a big hand.